In this video, we're going to discuss another divide and conquer sorting algorithm called quicksort. Quicksort is one of the most widely used sorting algorithms in practice. And typically, it's used as part of the sort algorithm in the C++ standard library. Now, the worst case running time of quicksort is theta of n squared. So there are inputs that make quicksort take time proportional to n squared, which might make it seem like you wouldn't want to use quicksort in practice. However, if you look at the average time to quicksort a vector of n elements, and you average that over all possible n factorial permutations of those elements, the average time that quicksort takes will be order n log n. So quicksort is typically fast for a random input, even though there exist inputs where that make it run quite slowly. And a big advantage that quicksort has over merge sort, for example, and you know merge sort has worst case running time, order n log n, but an advantage that quicksort has is that it is in place. So it just uses a constant amount of extra memory besides the you know, memory of the input vector. Uh, and like merge sort, quicksort is also a comparison-based algorithm but it is not a stable sorting algorithm as typically implemented. Okay, so let's look at quicksort. The first thing that quicksort does is choose an element of the vector. Uh, and this element is going to serve as what's called a pivot. So for simplicity, let's just choose the first element of the vector to be the pivot. In the second step, we want to put the pivot into a, position, into a position such that all the elements to its left are less than or equal to it, and all the elements to its right are greater than or equal to it. So note that that means that the pivot element is already in a valid final position in the sorted order of the vector. So this step is called the partition step because we partition the elements into two sets one, one set, uh, you know, all the elements are less than or equal to the pivot, and the other set, all the elements are greater than or equal to the pivot. Now, this partition step is the main subroutine of quicksort. Uh, and since we are not aiming for a stable algorithm, the partition step does not need to preserve order among elements with equal values. So you see that in my picture here, the blue three started to the left of the red three, but after the partition, uh, the blue three is on the right of the red three. And that's fine, because we're not going for a stable sorting algorithm. OK, and notice also that after this partition step, the five, what we're using as the pivot element, it is in a valid final position uh, for the whole vector to be sorted. So the remaining problem after the partition step is to sort the portion of the vector to the left of the pivot and to sort the portion of the vector to the right of the pivot. So this we're going to do recursively. So we again call quicksort to sort the elements to the left of the pivot and to sort the elements to the right of the pivot. And this is the entire quicksort algorithm. Okay, we choose a pivot, we partition on that pivot, and then we recursively call quicksort on the portion of the vector to the left of the pivot and the portion of the vector to the right of the pivot. So quicksort is a divide and conquer algorithm. We divide the problem into two subproblems to sort the elements to the left of the pivot and to sort the elements to the right of the pivot. When we discussed divide and conquer algorithms in general, we said that beyond solving the subproblems, the work in a divide and conquer algorithm could roughly be divided into three categories. Creating the subproblems, the complete step, so gathering any additional information needed to solve the problem beyond so the solution to the subproblems, and the combined step, so combining the solutions to the subproblems to find the solution to the original problem. So in quicksort, you don't know where the pivot element should go initially, right? You have to work in order to figure out where the pivot element should go. 
So since we don't know where the pivot element should go initially, we actually don't know what the subproblems are, right? It's only after we put the pivot element in the right place that we know what these subproblems are. So the main work of quicksort is actually in this create step, in the step of creating the subproblems. And that is exactly what the partition function does. So the partition function puts the pivot element in the right place, puts everything to its left, um, you know, make sure that everything to its left is less than or equal to it, everything to its right is greater than or equal to it, and now we've defined the subproblems so we can recursively call quicksort on the left uh, part and the right part. So the create step is the main work in quicksort. For the complete and combined steps, there's really no work to be done. Okay, so quicksort is all about creating the subproblems and recursively solving those subproblems. Okay, so let's look at the heart of quicksort, this partition function. For simplicity, let's suppose we're just sorting a vector of integers. The partition function is going to take as input two iterators. We have named the parameters begin and end here. And following the usual convention in C++, these iterators are going to define a half-closed interval. So the elements from begin up to but not including end. Our partition function is going to take the element pointed to by begin as the pivot. And its goal is to put the pivot in a correct position in the sorted order and arrange the elements such that everything from begin to the pivot is at most the pivot and everything to the right of the pivot up to but not including end is at least the pivot. The function is going to return an iterator which points to the uh, location of the pivot, so this proper place of the pivot. Okay, so let's look at an example of what the partition function does. Let's say that begin points to the first three in this picture and end points to one. Okay, so we want to partition the interval that is shaded in blue here. Okay, so we're going to use the three as the pivot. Okay, so we use the element pointed to by begin as the pivot. Okay, so let's look at the result of the partition function. So the, the bottom picture here. So you see that after we call the partition function, the pivot is in a place such that everything from begin up to and including the pivot is at most the value of the pivot and everything uh, from pi the position of the pivot plus one up to but not including end is at least the value of the pivot. So I'm going to leave how to do the partition step for the next video. In this video, we're just going to take the partition function as a black box and finish the analysis of quicksort. So what we need about the partition function is that it can be done in place and it can be done in time proportional to end minus begin. So that is the size of the interval that we're working on. Okay, so now that we've specified what the partition function does, let's finish quicksort. So here's the code for quicksort. It's a recursive algorithm, so we need to have a base case. The base case is just when the interval to sort is of size zero or one. In this case, the interval is already sorted, so there's nothing to do, we can just return. In the next step, we call the partition function. So after calling the partition function, the pivot element is in its correct location and it's pointed to by this return value, which we store in pivot it. So again, this partition function, it actually creates the subproblems for us. Everything to the left of pivot it is going to be at most the pivot and everything to the right is at least the pivot. So it now remains to sort the elements from begin up to but not including pivot it and to sort the elements from pivot it plus one up to but not including end. And that is what we do in the next two steps by recursively calling quicksort uh, from begin to pivot it and 
recursively calling a quick sort on the interval from pivoted plus one to end. Now let's talk about now let's talk about the running time of quick sort. I'm not going to go through the all the details of the analysis, which is a bit complicated. So I'm just going to give you the high level intuition for the analysis. Okay, so first we're going to simplify things by assuming that all the elements in the vector are distinct. We're, um, I'm also at the beginning going to make another assumption, which we'll see how to weaken in the next few slides. So first we're just going to imagine that the algorithm always does the best it possibly can. So we're going to assume that in every call to quick sort, we're somehow magically able to choose the best possible pivot. So the best pivot to choose is the median. So this choice is going to make the subproblems as equal in size as possible. OK, so let t of n be the running time of quick sort with this assumption that we're able to always magically choose the best element to be the pivot. So under that assumption, the running time of quicksort looks as follows. So remember that after partition, the pivot element is in the correct place. So we don't need to worry about uh, the pivot el element anymore. So um, after, since the pivot element is in the correct place, then, um, you know, and we're assuming that the pivot element is the median, then, you know, to its left, we're going to have uh, roughly n minus 1 over 2 elements, and to its right, we're going to have roughly n minus 1 over 2 elements. Okay? So, uh, you know, one problem is going to be, one subproblem is going to be of size the floor of n minus 1 over 2, and one sub subproblem is going to be of size the ceiling of n minus 1 over 2. So that's the time to solve the subproblems. We also have the time to create the subproblems. That's done by the partition function. And we said that the partition function can be done in time proportional to the size of the interval it's working on. So that costs us theta of n in this case. OK, so, so that's it. That's the recurrence formula for the running time of quicksort. So this is the same recurrence relation that we had for merge sort. So we know that its solution is theta of n log n. OK, so, so that's good. So now we need to talk about how to weaken this assumption that we're somehow magically able to choose the perfect pivot element. OK, so we're going to weaken this assumption a bit at first by saying that, say that we just choose pretty good pivots. OK, so say that a pivot is pretty good if when we partition on that pivot, we're left with two subproblems that are both of size at least n over 10. OK, so you know the, the bad case is when you get subproblems that are very lopsided in size. OK, so now we're just going to assume that we can choose, uh, that we always choose a pretty good pivot. And with a pretty good pivot, both subproblems are of size at least n over 10. OK, so let uh, t of n be the running time of quicksort with this assumption that we always are able to pick a pretty good pivot. Then we can bound t of n as t of n divided by 10 plus t of 9n divided by 10. So now that's kind of the, um, you know, the worst case to solve these, these two subproblems. And then we still have the time for the partition algorithm, which is order n. OK, and now you can work out the solution to this recurrence relation. And it still turns out to be order of n log n. OK, but even this weakening of the assumption is too strong. In real life, we're, we're not going to be always able to choose a pretty good pivot. OK, sometimes we're going to have bad pivots. But you can see that even if half the time we choose a bad pivot, that's not really a problem. You know, if, if half the time we choose a pretty good pivot and half the time we choose a bad pivot, then the running time is still going to be order n log n. 
Okay, and now this is kind of getting to be a more realistic assumption that for most inputs, um, you know, half the time we're going to be choosing a pretty good pivot. So a bit more formally, let's say that we have indistinct integers and look at all possible in input vectors using those in integers. Okay, so all permutations of those in integers, all in factorial permutations. So we can run quicksort on each of these in factorial mini input vectors and see how much time quicksort takes. Okay, and what you can show is that the average time, averaged over all these in factorial possibilities, is theta of n log n. And again, the intuition behind this is that for most inputs, when we look at the running of quicksort on that input, then you know half the time we're going to be picking a good pivot. So that's going to be leading to this running time of order n log n. Okay, so that's kind of the high level intuition for why the average case complexity of quicksort is order n log n. Now let's look at the worst case complexity of quicksort. So the worst case arises when the two subproblems are as lopsided as possible. And for the version of quicksort that we have described, you actually get this behavior when the input vector is already sorted. Okay, so let's see an example of that. So say the input vector just has the numbers one through n, uh, one through eight. Okay, so we use the, um, you know, the first element as the pivot. So we use one as the pivot initially. But there are no numbers less than one in this vector, right? All the rest of the numbers are greater than one. Okay, so kind of the left subproblem has size zero, and the right subproblem has size seven. You know, if you think more generally, um, we take the numbers one through n, then the right subproblem is going to have size n minus one. Okay, so we've only decreased the size of our subproblem by one. So we get these very lopsided subproblems. Okay, now let's continue. So now consider solving this right subproblem. We again take the first element of this interval to be the pivot. So now the pivot is two. And when we partition with two, we again have this behavior. The left subproblem has size zero, right? In this interval, you know, from two to eight, there are no numbers which are less than two. And the right subproblem has size six, or, you know, in general, it's going to have size n over two, n minus two. Okay, so again, we just reduce the size of the problem by one. Okay, and, and you can see that we'll keep getting this kind of behavior, right? Each round of partition only decreases the size of uh, the subproblem by, by one, or, or rather we get one subproblem of size zero and one subproblem which is of size one smaller. Okay, so now the number of times that we're going to have to call partition is going to be n minus one. And each call to part partition takes time proportional to the size of the subproblem. So when we call uh, partition for the ith time, the size of the subproblem is n minus i, right? This first time we called it, uh, it, it was size n minus one, second time n minus two, etc. So the running time in this, uh, you know, when the vector is already sorted, is going to be proportional to this familiar sum that we've already seen a couple times in this course, the sum of the first n minus one integers. And, you know, we know that this sum is n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Okay, so that shows that this version of quicksort that we have given takes time omega of n squared when the input vector is already sorted. Okay, now let's look at the upper bound on the worst case complexity of quicksort. So the partition algorithm, you know, a nice thing about it is that it always puts at least one element in the proper place every time that we call it. And in that element, we don't have to worry about it anymore because it's already in its proper place in the sorted vector. Okay, so since we partition uh, function always puts one element in the proper place, 
at least, we are only ever going to have to call the partition function at most n times, since we have n elements to start with. And also, the partition function is always going to take time order n, right? because any interval that we consider is at most the size of the entire vector, which is n. So we're only going to call uh, the partition function at most n times, and every time we call it, um, it takes time order n. So that shows that for any input, the running time of quicksort is going to be order n squared. Okay, so now we've shown that the running time of quicksort is always order n squared, and that there exists an input where the running time is omega of n squared. So we can say that the worst case complexity of quicksort is theta of n squared.